Good evening everyone and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Just as we come to look at God's word, let's pause and let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we just pause now to come into your presence. We pause to give you thanks for the day that has been so far. To give you thanks for all the goodness that you have bestowed upon us this day, for everything you've given to us. Lord, we thank you that we've had food, that we've had shelter. We thank you for just the opportunity now to be able to come together to to look at your word and to examine it um, as your people. Lord, you are, you are so good to us. We are so blessed by you. Forgive us whenever we take this for granted. Lord, we just continue to give you thanks for the hard work that's going on in our country. Uh, by all our um, key workers and by those who are getting us vaccinated. Uh, and we thank you for the fact that this can happen and the fact this happens so quickly. We just ask in the meantime, Lord, you continue to look after us and care for us and just protect. But as we stop now, Lord, to, to study your word, just calm and settle our hearts, we pray. Help us to draw close to you. Help us to feel your presence. Help us to be able to set aside the things that have concerned us this day, just to, now to, to look at your word, just to see what it would say to us, as you would um, encourage us through your word, as you would draw near to us, as you would, as you would challenge us as well. And Lord, may we truly know uh, you with us as we do this. So, Father, thank you. And continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are continuing in Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. We're going to be picking up at verse number 18. So let me read to you verse 18 to the end, which is verse 29 of Hebrews chapter 12 at this time. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom and whirlwind, as Israel Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They sp staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only the unshakable things remain. Since we are, a king, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Amen. And that takes us just to the end of Hebrews um, chapter 12. If you think back to what how Hebrews chapter 12 starts off, talking just about not forgetting the Lord's discipline, accepting his discipline, meaning uh, um, that God loves us, um, and how we have to be careful to keep in peace and not let what we're doing be corrupted by anything and um, then we come to this 
striking image uh, that we find from verse 18 onwards. Again, a lot of you know, a lot of it is, well, it's all based in the Old Testament and a lot of it is based on, or it maybe assumes that we have a knowledge of the Old Testament and of the time that the Israelites received the law from God. So it's talking about that time whenever God brings his people to Mount Sinai, Moses is going to go up Mount Sinai to receive um, the Ten Commandments, as we call them, the two tablets of stone. And the command that was given to the people and what they experienced as they waited for Moses. So as they came to Mount Sinai, the presence of God descended onto the mountain. So you have the idea of smoke and fire around the mountain. And the people were told not to set foot on the mountain. Not to even let an animal set foot on the mountain. And if anybody did, it was going to be stoned, they were just be stoned to death because the mountain was holy because God's presence, part of God's presence was going to be there with Moses as God spoke to Moses, as Moses received these commandments, as he uh, recorded what God said to him and as God passed on the law to him. And it's very um, much based on senses. So you, first of all, you've got the visual sights. A place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom and a whirlwind. Then, so that's one sense. So it's appealing to those, the sense of sight. Then you get the sense of sound. An awesome trumpet blast. And a voice so terrible that they beg God to stop speaking. If you remember, the people were so frightened um, that they didn't want God to speak to them directly. They just wanted God to speak to Moses. And then Moses could relay to them what God had said. And it was the same whenever Moses then, after this time, whenever they were encamped and there was a, a tent of meeting. Before the tabernacle was established, there was a tent of meeting which sat on the edge of the camp. And Moses would go into that tent to meet with God. And it said, it said whenever Moses came out afterwards, he had to veil his face. Because his face was so bright and radiant, having been in the presence of, of God, that the people were frightened to look upon him. So again, you know, it, it, it's that whole sense of respect and awe and um, just them realising how powerful God is uh, and what sort of response they would have to God within that setting. It says in verse, tw in verse 20, they staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. And um, that's a quote taken from Exodus chapter 19 and verse 13. So, you know, the people were frightened of God. The people realised that God himself was powerful, that they couldn't mess with God. Yet it's sad how... When Moses goes up the mountain and they think he's not coming back, how they, they turn away, isn't it? And how they get Aaron to make him a golden calf, you know. It even says about Moses himself, so verse 21, Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. And that's a quote taken from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 19. So even Moses himself had a, had a fear about him in meeting God. It was a reverent fear. It was quite right because he had seen God do amazing things, incredible things, and some what they would have classed as you know terrible. You might think of terrible things. You think about the, the judgment. So even from right from the very start, as Moses sees the burning bush symbol, um, we're so used to within the Presbyterian Church that burning bush. A bush which is on fire but not consumed, the bush showing the presence of God, that it is a living presence. Um, you know, so Moses seeing the living, the, the burning bush going on through to the signs and, and miracles that God gave him to show to Pharaoh, to release the people, to the plagues, to the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of the Egyptian army. And then how God feeds the people and gives them water whenever they're in the wilderness. You know, Moses has seen some incredible things. So, yeah, the voice of God coming across as a trumpet, as thunder, um, it's frightening. You know, 
But the writers here said, you're not, you're not facing that. You're not coming to that. You know, you're, you're not in that sense of, oh, if, if I touch this, I'm going to be, it's mounted, I'm going to be struck down. So that's not where you are. You're in a com different place. You know, the, the people very much in those days, they just saw the judgment of God. Whereas now you're seeing the grace of God working out. Um, it says in verse 22, Know you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You know, you're in a different place. You're seeing something different. You have seen Jesus come and die on the cross. You've seen the means of forgiveness. You're not listening to the voice of God and, and trembling in fear at that. No, rather you're seeing the outworking of grace. It says you've come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God himself, who is a judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. We're in a different relationship. You know, God was very much separate from the people at the start because of sin. Even think of the, the tabernacle and the temple. You had the inner parts, the holy of holies. Um, as it's mentioned earlier on in Hebrews, and the people couldn't go in because of sin, because of God and the presence of God. Whereas that barrier has been removed through Christ. It says in verse 24, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenants between God and people, and to sprinkle and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness, instead of crying out. For vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Again, a very powerful image, the sprinkled blood. That's the blood that was sprinkled on what was called the atonement seat, which was the wings of the, the golden cherubims that, that were um, placed above the Ark of the Covenant within the inner part of the temple, where the high priest sprinkled the blood once a year for the forgiveness of the um, sins that hadn't been forgiven by other sacrifices or the unforgiven sins or the unknown sins to make the nation right with God. He says, you have come to that place. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates, the one who is doing it. Jesus' blood now replaces that blood. That blood no longer needs to be sprinkled because Christ has shed his blood instead. It's the new covenant you know the new covenant that reminds us of what jesus said himself um as he came to the lord's you know as he came to the last supper and then as paul institutes in in first corinthians that you, you know um communion um talking about the, the the jesus blood is the new covenant between god and people um the blood of forgiveness it's not a blood of vengeance as Abel's blood and again reflecting back in the Old Testament whenever Cain killed Abel and God said to Cain Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground seeking vengeance for what you have done so we're we're in a different situation to those um God's chosen people at first to those Israelites they they very much lived in fear simply fear and trembling they didn't see the grace well they did at times, whenever um, they had sinned and Moses was showing them how to be forgiven, they were, they were seeing grace at that stage. Uh, but a lot of them didn't accept it. Just like the quote that we, um, we've seen before in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Um, the people, if they looked upon that bronze snake, um, received grace, God's grace and God's forgiveness for the sins that they had committed. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's that image. But the people very much lived in fear and trembling. But even in this, there is still that warning that if we don't accept Christ, that there is judgment. Verse 25, be careful you do not refuse to listen to the one, one in capitals, who is speaking, Jesus. For if the people of Israel did not escape 
when they refuse to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. You know, it was bad enough for the children of Israel when they turned their back on Moses, whenever they refused to listen to Moses. Look at the judgment they faced. But if we don't listen to Jesus, ooh, it'll be far worse for us. It's a stark warning, isn't it? It's sometimes a warning which we ignore or which people don't see in the New Testament as they think, of, oh, it's just God is a God of love in the New Testament. But no, God is a God of justice. Yes, he gives us grace, something which um, we don't see all that often in the Old Testament. Um, but in the New Testament with the coming of Christ, then we see that grace. And it talks about then, it says, when God spoke on Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. That's actually a quote from Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. That was looking forward to final judgment of the earth. Um, whenever everyone will be called to account, whenever Christ will return and it says that the earth and the heavens will be shaken. We're told the, earth, the heaven and earth will pass away and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. It says in verse 27, this means that all of creation will be shaken and removed. And removed, see that? So that only unshakable things will remain. So in other words, everything will be done away with except for those who've accepted Christ. The unshakable things. So only those whose name, as, as the Revelation put it, whose name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, or only those who have got that personal relationship with God will remain. And then it says in verse 28, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe, for God is a devouring fire. God wouldn't be called a devouring fire if there's not judgment coming. We wouldn't be called to worship him with holy fear and awe again if there wasn't judgment. And we've got to remember that Christ's death does not remove judgment. But Christ's death and accepting what he has done for us in his resurrection gives us the means away from judgment and a means of forgiveness and into grace. Maybe it's not a, a very politically correct thing to talk about in these days, that we will be called the account, that we will be held responsible. Um, but it's what the Bible teaches and it's the truth of the Bible. You know, God is not going to say to everybody, I know you've done wrong, but you know what? I love you, so it's all right. Come on into heaven anyway. I know you didn't follow me and I know you, you turned your back on me, but you know what? I, I, I love you anyway because you're my, you're my creation. So just come on into heaven. It's not that. It is what it says in um, verse 25 about if we do not listen or if we refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. If we refuse to listen to what Christ is telling us, what Jesus is telling us, then we're in a lost, what's called a lost eternity, or we will not be in heaven. John 14, Jesus says very clearly, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes onto the Father except through me. And we're told that if we have not accepted Christ, then we have not accepted the Father. If we reject Christ, we reject the Father. It's a stark warning. It's a stark reality. It brings us back down to earth again. We've been talking about how God loves us and how he'll discipline us. But this is more than discipline now. This is judgment. And if we don't accept him, what awaits us? A devouring fire. That's who God is. Now, is it a literal fire or is it a metaphorical fire? We don't know. Fire is quite often used as judgment within the Old Testament and within the New Testament. And uh, you look in Revelation, um, the reference to hell and fire, right way through the Bible, even it's always there. It's it's to represent 
and and we don't know if that will be a literal or if it will represent something else but it does represent pain it does represent suffering it does represent a difficult time and that's what judgment will be but the writer doesn't want people to face that he wants people to keep following Christ and to know the presence of God with them. Verse 13. We'll go into verse 13 in chapter 13. Um, starts off, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters, or in brotherly love. Um, the word brethren um, means can mean brothers and sisters. So don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some have done have done for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it remember those in prison as if it were yourself remember those who are being mistreated um, as if you felt their pain in your own bodies he turns back to the believers now he turns back to those who are following christ so there's been a warning which is to those who don't know jesus that they they should turn away and that they should follow him and now the reader the writer then turns back to those who do know Jesus, those who are Christians who are following the teachings of Christ. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. That means care for each other. You know, if you've got a brother or a sister, you'll understand this. If you don't have a brother and sister, then yes, it might be hard to understand this, but siblings do fight. Siblings do fall out with one another, believe it or not. But even whenever siblings are falling out with one another, it's funny, um, if somebody says something against their brother or sister, then they'll always come to their defence because that's my brother or that's my sister. And you don't say that about my brother or sister or you don't do that to my brother and sister. We, we, we stand up for each other. And it's, this, it's, it's love. It, and that's the same within the Christian family. That's what the author's telling us. We should stand up for one another. We should love one another. We should care for one another. Now, it's not that we, we are hostile to anybody else, but it's that we should have that care and concern. And the love is, it, it's, it, it's agape love. It's, it's love which is sacrificial. It's not romantic love. It's not brotherly love. It, it's sacrificial love that we should look out for one another. So it's so important to understand the meaning of the word love, that it's looking out for the, the, the good and the welfare of each other. And then it's really interesting to see what it says in verses 2 and 3. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realising it. Have you ever entertained an angel? You wouldn't know, sure you wouldn't. But the author says, show hospitality to strangers. Show basically practical love. Care for them. Because some people in doing so have entertained angels. And we have to take that literally, that they have entertained angels. Um, that they have shown that care. Maybe it's a way of God seeing how we will respond. Testing us nearly, you could think. Um, and it says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember those who are mistreated as if you felt pain in your own bodies. It, it's actually, it's identifying with one another, isn't it? Actually, to understand what each other is going through. Now, we find that difficult, maybe to grasp, we get our heads around. How do we know what it's like to be in prison um, in, this, in the Western world? Because it doesn't happen to us. But it means that we shouldn't disregard the persecuted church, or we shouldn't dismiss it. But actually get to know, be informed, so that you can pray intelligently for your brothers and sisters. Show them love. So that you can care for them or send them things that they need. Show them love. Um, so that you can feel their pain in your own body. So that you, 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 you feel what they feel. Show them love. And, and it's about that being united. You know, so often we say, oh, it's not happening to me, so it doesn't apply to me. But actually, Hebrews teaches, well, it may not be happening to you. But because it's happening to a brother or sister in the Lord, then it does concern you. It does affect you. You are involved. 
and we have to involve ourselves in that. That's a huge challenge, isn't it? And when it comes to mission work, maybe the extent of our mission involvement is to, to put some money in a mission envelope. Now, don't get me wrong, that is very important. And that is a very practical means and ways of supporting the work of a mission. But don't just put some money in a mission envelope. Actually, find out where that money goes. Find out how it's used. Find out how it helps or what difference it makes. You know, a few weeks ago in church, we showed a video um, from Platform 67 and it was all about um, letting people see the work of Platform 67 and what they do. It's the same over the next few while in church, we will continue to um, give some information about the mission organisations that we support so that we can be informed so that we can draw alongside and help and support and pray intelligently and show love to one another because that's what we have to do. How can we show love this week? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for how it encourages us that we have your grace. Thank you as well for the challenges it brings to us. And Lord, help us to, to face those challenges head on and to be continuing to love one another day in and day out. Father, thank you. Continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in. Good to see you. Um, trust that you continue to know God's peace, presence and blessing. Please remember continue to stay safe. We're back again next week for our Bible study again. And next week again, we will have a time of prayer by Zoom afterwards. Uh, if you'd like any of those details, contact myself or contact Barbara in the office. Take care and God bless.